Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you for coming out this morning. Welcome to Princeton Future and the Public Library's presentation. Recently, uh, Sheldon sent me a website called Wallet Hub, which uh, listed Princeton, New Jersey as the best small city in America. Now, I'm skeptical of websites ranking of various things, um, but I looked into it, I thought it was kind of interesting. And what I found most strange is that Princeton ranked number one in small cities in America while ranking 745th in affordability. <laughs> Out of how many? Out of um, 1,200. So I guess that means we have a really great small city town that we have somehow become accustomed to paying a whole lot for. And I guess that means we feel like we get a whole lot of value for that. So we also rank 160th in education. I would have guessed we would have ranked higher, but what do I know? Quality of life, 19. So there's an aggregate score. Uh, they scored um, 33 key ingredients to come up with this ranking. Um, and we ranked number one in economic health. So I don't really understand the algorithm that gets you one in economic health and 745th in affordability. But I'm an architect, and we always underestimate things. Cause anyway. It's a fine rating. So, um, but check it out if you want on Wallet Hub. Uh, Lexington, Mass. is the second. Leewood, Kansas is the third. Milton, Mass. is fourth. So we have some good, strong competition. One of the things that's challenging in the affordability of Princeton... Can we take the lights down a little? All right, Barry, let me see what I can do. Uh -huh. I'm going to push random buttons and see what happens. <laughs> You know, so look at oh, oh, wait, I'm sorry. Does that, that, that knocked a few out. Does that do anything, Barry? No? No. Nope. no. I suspect it's the... All right, let's push another button. Do we like that one? Keep going. Keep going. Yeah. Let's Keep push going. some more buttons. It's getting better. Keep going. Better? Yeah. Yeah. better. Yeah. All right. Option D. No, I don't like option D. Option E. F. G. Now, they only give us nine free program buttons. All right, so you got to pick one of those. Let's leave it at this. So we can get the benefit of your expertise. How's that? That's far. Undo the last one. Undo the last one. You know what that one is. Can you do it that How's that? I'm afraid I just can't get those three lights on. One of them's pointing at me, though. All right. So one of the things that relates to issues of affordability um, is our mobility and transit around town. Um, as you know, one of the things that makes us desirable, uh, I see Sam Bunting's in the office, and he can speak to this, is the walkability, the high walkability factor of our community. In fact, it ranks the highest in the state of New Jersey. More people in Princeton walk to work than any other community in our state. Um, but nonetheless, cars remain a problem because most of us, while we could walk some places, inevitably need to get in our car to get out to Route 1 or north to Montgomery or to the two major metropolitan areas or out to the Dinky Station or the train station or whatever. So we haven't really been able to escape cars, and there are predictions that someday we might, uh, but that's a ways off, and we have to deal with the practical reality of today. So in light of that, um, our elected officials, the municipal government commissioned a study, it was managed by our engineering department, uh, looking at parking in our community. And they didn't look town-wide, they looked in the core central business district uh, and the adjacent, immediately adjacent neighborhoods, 
uh, and university facilities um, that represent, in some regards, about 70% of the old borough boundaries. Uh, it didn't include the shopping center. It did not include uh, North Witherspoon Municipal Complex. And um, so, I jumped ahead. So these were the goals that the uh, elected officials in the engineering department laid out for Nelson Nygaard, which is the firm that did the study. Um, and their goals, as you can see, I'm not going to be one of these presenters that reads the stuff that's in text in front of you, because that's, <clears> to me, personally annoying. So you can see the six goals that were outlined. Um, but they focus on, basically, on residential needs and business health for the community and how parking <clears throat> relates to that. So I'm just going to take you through a couple highlights of findings of the report, and then we're going to look quickly at recommended strategies. I'm not going to take you through step by step of every hearing they had. There was a meeting um, a week ago Monday at the Nassau Inn where they did that, and these images are actually from that presentation. So one headline, there's 7,025 parking spaces. Um, hang on, let me try to get where I can see this. So there's 7,025 parking spaces uh, in this district. 5,400 of them are off-street spaces. And 1,600 and change are on-street spaces. And there's a little uh, map that shows the area that was in the survey. And here's a little chart down here that shows all the various regulations that cover those spaces. Uh, 7,025 parking spaces in the center of the community. It's a pretty healthy number, actually. They analyzed usage throughout the day, throughout the week, and came up with uh, a couple, two interesting facts I want to share with you about peak demand. So peak demand is, of those 7,025 spaces, how many are being used at maximum time of use? There's two peak times. There is Thursday right after lunch, during lunch. You see a chart here, charts from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. The number of spaces that are utilized. And at 1 p.m., we're only using about half of our parking spaces. Somehow I would have guessed more, but that's not the fact. But the distribution is important. I yes, mean, of course, Barry. That number is... Yeah, but as an aggregate number, we're talking about community capacity, and this is the fact. Well, it's a fact, but not a useful one. Yes, it is, Barry. <laughs> the next peak is Saturday at 7 p.m., so as you... In would imagine that's a different profile. Those are visitors coming to town to go to restaurants, to go to events at the various at McCarter and at the university. And again, peak utilization is only half of the capacity that exists in the community Saturday night at 7. The core, as you can see, is around Palmer Square. So look at the chart on the left, around Palmer Square and Nassau Street, Spring Street, Van Diemen, Williams, they're at 100% or 90 to 100% capacity. So if you make that loop to you, it's going to look like all the parking spaces are full. But if you look at the other areas on that map, they're actually underutilized. Can you go back to that map? Just sure, of course. Thanks. So Saturday demand is a little more leveled out than a weekday demand. Um, and it peaks later in the day than during the weekday. So the weekday peak is during lunchtime when people come in for lunch as well as all the business people are in town at that point. Yes, ma'am. 
Could, could you just name, just quickly hit those light, the green ones that are at 60% capacity? Um, okay, so 60 to 80. Yeah. 185 Nassau. Okay. Now that's not for public use during weekdays, right. but on Saturday it is. The university allows anyone to park in their lots after 5 p.m. on a weekday and all through the weekends. So Williams, here's... How many people would know that? Ah, we're going to get to that. But clearly not enough is the answer to your question. Clearly not enough people know all of these things, and we're going to talk about that. So, so the dense, red-hot zone of parking density is Palmer Square, Nassau, Spring, Tulane, Witherspoon, Van Duvenberg, <coughs> Down Park Place, all along Nassau, down to East Nassau, Williams, Olden, poor people on Pine Street, they didn't help. Going down Witherspoon, look at that, it's highly underutilized. Down here, down the university, here's the Lewis Center for the Arts. Here's the Dinky Station, underutilized. <clears throat> Dickens, underutilized. The lot at the municipal building. Here's Harrison Street. I think Harrison's actually off the map. That's right. the, I'm sorry, that's the lot at the <clears throat> municipal building? Can you go back to that light green one that's back or else? No, this is the university lot. Uh, at the corner of University Place and Mercer, okay. where the, um, I think the communications office is there now, they come into there. Uh, the municipal building lot actually should show up. It doesn't. It's right there. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> now there are some local neighborhood densities up on <laughs> Witherspoon, on um, Quarry, John, down Lee Avenue, a little bit on Birch. But that's probably neighborhood parking for people in that neighborhood on midday Saturday. Yeah, so it's the restaurants down there. Yeah, we just got a new one, so it's yeah. getting worse. So I, I, I ran through the first one on Thursday. Do you want to look at that in a little more detail? Or? Oh, that's great. I just wanted to so, understand the yellow. So the university lots, they're all at work, right? So they're jammed up. Here's a park place. Um, spruce. Is this chestnut? I can't really read that. Or is that Moran? Um, Olden again, Williams. Spring Street Garage. Full. Oh, why did that silence go on? You said Maple and Linden filled on the right side. What's that? that Maple and Linden filled on the right side. Pine, Maple, and Linden, and look, they're jammed up. Okay. Now here's an interesting fact, and we'll talk about why later. Chamber Street Garage and Hullfish Garage are not jammed up. More expensive. Yeah. Bingo. Yeah. We'll get to that. Okay. Um, and there's moderate density down at the Lewis Center and the Dinky Lot. Um, and up through the Witherspoon Jackson neighborhood. So that's Thursday. Kevin? Yes. Is Marvin off limits? It's a big lot. Mike, I don't know for a fact. I do know they have a, a loose agreement with the Senior Resource Center yeah. where they allow some spillover the parking from uh, the Suzanne Patterson building. I don't know that that's an official agreement. I know that it's not the case now during construction of their new visitor center that's closed off. Um, uh, but those spaces with which there are many were clearly not counted in that 7,025 of available parking spaces. They're so, not municipal. Well, the 7,025 spaces are not all municipal. That's the total aggregate amount of parking spaces in a survey area. So some are municipal, many are private. I think that I'm gonna, I have a slide about that, but I think it's 70% private, 30% public. 
Yes, sir. Did they count the number of cars at this period? That's how you came up with the capacity of how many are used. So the number of cars versus the number of actual spaces. So the dark shading, starting at 7 a.m., there's 1,739 cars parked. It peaks at 3,941 at 1 o'clock and drops back down to 9 p.m. There's still 2,226 cars parked. Yes, sir. Do they split it out um, between the, uh, the garage parking versus the street parking to look at the comparison of the density? They do. Um, and I just have some summary information about that, which I'll get to. But I mean, in a nutshell, uh, it relates to pricing. So our municipal garage is less expensive than the Palmer Square garages. Therefore, it's more full. It's jammed at midday, and the hull fish and, and chambers are not. Um, so, you know, when we get to solutions, one thing we want to think about someday is that should standardization or pricing be a good idea? And if it was considered to be a good idea, how would you actually engineer that with a private entity like Palmer Square? Okay. So, parking constraints, and there are constraints, they're just not a result of insufficient supply of spaces. Okay. Underutilized capacity at all times. Off, now here I'm reading what I said I wasn't going to read. <laughs> I really need to get a we'll new job. We'll forgive you. But I want to emphasize this because it's it's a really important lesson. So many people say we need more parking. We need to do this. We need to build this. We need to build that. The takeaway at the end of the day is we need to better manage what we have. We actually have plenty of capacity. We just don't manage it very well. We don't have a comprehensive system for everyone to understand what's available at what time at what price point. So it creates a perception of scarcity when you do your loop around Palmer Square and drive down Nassau Street and cut around Spring Street, you don't see any on-site, on-street parking space. There are a lot that you can't see and you have no real means of understanding how they are in a convenient way and you're really not gonna drive up and down every street of the town in search of that. So it would be great if somebody would actually tell you that, so you could drive right there. So management can provide relief. More supply would just perpetuate the current shortcomings. So if we don't really manage better the supply that we have, we just go build more, and we haven't actually addressed our problem. Uh, this off-street parking, much of it's restricted. Um, and a lot of that excess capacity of the 7,025 are in parking lots that are not, to your imagination, publicly accessible. So university lots, for example, and during the weekday up to 5 o'clock, they're not open to non-university employees. Um, but after 5, on the weekends they are. Numerous churches and towns, uh, parking lots for commercial establishments, office buildings, uh, the back of the office buildings along Park Place, those lots sit vastly idle on weekends uh, because that parking is restricted for the employees and the people who occupy those buildings, but it is actual capacity that should it be better managed could be available for use, for example, in some of those weekend peaks. We have in our town 28 <coughs> different regulations about parking. So for you to be on top of your parking game in Princeton, you need to memorize 28 <coughs> different possible time limit zones and keep those at the tip of your tongue as you ride around and look at meter or neighborhood streets and remember which is which. I certainly can't do that. Um, so you see, this is a summary of those 1,633 public spaces, Mike. You asked about which is private, which is public. So this applies to the public spaces, the 1,600 spaces. Um, Could I ask a question sure, about that? One of the things that concerns me is that on street parking, there seem to be only two handicapped places that I know in Princeton, and they're on Palmer Square somewhere. But we have people who would shop on Nassau Street and other places, but there's no handicap provision there. Is that uh, 
something we need to worry about? Uh, now we absolutely. This mismatch? Uh, absolutely. Um, our, our system is fairly rigid, inflexible, not adaptable to needs, which change candidly throughout the course of a single day, throughout the course of seasons, throughout weather. So um, we certainly don't have enough spaces, and we don't have enough in spaces that are accessible for travel lanes, points of access for people in, um, you know, in a wheelchair. So as I suggested earlier, and this is, I imagine, intuitive, but we don't always sort of think about it, but the pricing influences patterns of how people park, okay? So Spring Street, for the reason I just told you, okay? Um, and on the weekends, Palmer Square actually offers better deal for parking than during weekdays. Palmer Square has a significant shopping and business load during the week. I can't really afford to do that, but on the weekends, their garages are underutilized. So look, you could park there all day Sunday for four bucks. You could park any day after four for three dollars for the rest of the day. Um, so, and another fact that came out is on-street parking spikes after seven o'clock when our meter enforcement ends. Kind of makes sense. Hey, it's free. Park. I'll stay there. It also, so this parking dispar the pricing disparity intensifies on street demand. And time limits, those meters that are 30 minutes, two hours, four hours, six hours. They actually intensify off-street demand on weekends because people who come on the weekends aren't necessarily on a business or office mission of a two-hour duration. They're coming to hang out, walk up and down Nassau Street, visit Dome Alley, that's a plug. <laughs> go to restaurants, go to shops, enjoy themselves. And to the extent that they're concerned about getting a ticket at one hour and 59 minutes, it actually limits the enjoyment of their experience in Princeton. So that drives more people into the garages. Well, you know, it's okay. But um, there is actually a lot of on-street capacity. Yes, Mary? Isn't there also a, a, a grace period after the meter? Yeah, we'll get to that. There is an eight-minute grace period on our meters. Um, our consultants believe, interestingly enough, that that's not enough. Um, so we'll, I'll, I'll come to that in a little bit when we look at our solutions. Here's a survey uh, that was done in the community by our consultants that you all participated in, either online or at, uh, there were some public meetings. And I put this up just to show you two features that are interesting to me personally, and there are many more things that are interesting. But the, um, the green band at the bottom are people that park in a lot, so obviously, people that park in a lot that they pay for hourly or daily. Uh, the very bottom dark blue are people who found a lot where they can park for free. So, say that again, please. The very bottom no, dark no, no, no. blue of the of the band. The previous part, the green part is. The green are people who pay to park. Does that include people who? Have in a lot, in a not lot. not on a space. In a lot. The next band, the, the lightest green, um, are people who park on street in metered spaces. The um, brown band are on street in unmetered spaces. And then, so look at the, so what's interesting to me is look at the number of employees who park in on street metered spaces. So these are employees, people who work. These are parking in meters. They should be in a lot, ideally. Um, the pricing, candidly, is such that they they can they can bear that cost. They're feeding the meter. Correct. That and that That's is exactly, exactly correct. Formally illegal, no? Exactly. Yeah. So. 
Um, but it is, but nonetheless, while there is slight distortion from customers to residents to employees, there is large similarity in the proportions of people who have parking paid for by their employer in a lot, parking on the street, and then people go park on streets where there are no meters, and then the people who, you know, walk downtown. Residential parking uh, is, a, is a related issue here. Um, so the residential neighborhoods, uh, specifically Tree Streets and Witherspoon Jackson, suffer most from spillover parking of uh, downtown. When I uh, did a project on Spruce Street um, for my clients, uh, we started seven, and I was kind of amazed to watch the traffic from seven to eight as the employees of the local plumbing outfit pulled up and parked on the street and their employer's van came and picked them up and then other people came and parked there and walked up to Nassau Street. Um, I live on the clean street. Um, I used to live on Green Street. I saw the similar, same thing happen on Green Street in the morning. So people in those neighborhoods are familiar with this phenomenon. Uh, it's clearly uh, a, a negative impact on the residents of those two neighborhoods to have this happening, um, and that should somehow be addressed. There's another group of people who catch the New York bus at the east end of town yes. yes. and park on the streets. On rivers. It has exactly the same effect. I, I, I remember when I did uh, theater with Milton Lyon, Milton would always tell me, well, you go down and you park on, um, park on Riverside, because it's a township, and then you can stay overnight, and then get a ticket, and come back, and get your car, and come back into town. That was a little bit of Milton Lyon impersonation when I knew Bill. Um, and finally, a problem that was identified is that the parking requirements slow reinvestment in existing properties because they are onerous that we require you to provide your parking on your site. And when you change the use of your commercial property from one type to another, it can trigger a different set of parking requirements which are often impossible to meet on an existing built site and it creates um, a log jam either at the planning board for poor Wanda or at the zoning board for poor Barry of people showing up asking to somehow testify that oh of course our business won't generate any more parking when you know candidly it will and hiring a bunch of people to sort of go through this scenario of proving to the community, well, the impacts are relatively equal and everyone will be okay. And, and eventually we relent and let them make improvement because it's just ultimately nuts to not to let people improve their buildings and refresh their stores and change the, the use. But it happens on a case-by-case, step-by-step basis, which is expensive, time-consuming, awkward, not predictable and inconvenient to staff who process mountains and mountains of paper and inconvenient to the citizens who volunteer on these boards that should be focusing on serious, you know, needed cases of variances for true hardship causes. Uh, and candidly, there should be a process to manage this better, I believe. <coughs> yes, Ingrid. Um, Kevin, you just now mentioned um, people come, wanting to come here who can't because of the regulations. It seems like you were speaking to us who are sort of Princetonians, free, uh, very um, generally described, uh, and our problems <coughs> with parking. Was there any analysis of how these parking difficulties, either finding spaces or not knowing the rules or the cost, is having an impact on the attractiveness of uh, people wanting to work here or come here and spend money. How much can we say anything about what that means for the vitality of the town as being a regional center? Uh, I, I'm not clear. I know when you count the cars, you can't figure out where they're coming from. But is there any indication that what you've described may have something to do with the, the value of property or the vitality of our businesses? So 
Uh, Ingrid, this report did not address that specific topic in anything other than just general way. And this report looked at the uh, difficulties of meeting parking requirements for uh, commercial applications. Um, uh, what I found interesting in the uh, appendix when I looked at the, uh, what the consultants took into consideration uh, from our uh, municipal staff about parking coming from future development projects, there were only two projects on the books coming that would add, one was six spaces and one was nine spaces. So in a, in a community that ranks number one as the best small city in America to have only two projects on the books coming, I don't know, it seems a little low to me. You, I would think we'd have a little more reinvestment going on and more projects and more people trying to improve their buildings. Uh, but no, Ingrid, they, they didn't try to make a correlation between the cost to people investing in the community of this, other than I just point out the what appears to be somewhat, um, you know, stagnation of redevelopment. Yes, sir. I, I think numbers are important, and I didn't see a correlation between the percentages in the charts that you showed and the numbers because the numbers were based on the survey. So I urge you to and go. The other, yes, the other thing is that right. demand is what's desired, and need is what's required. And you have to make a distinguish yeah. so distinction between. Yeah. So distinction between. So numbers. yes, I agree. And I want to say to you, I've pulled four or six images out of a 200-page report. There's exhaustive appendices that show all the quantitative documentation for these numbers. So there's a couple places you can find this report. Actually, I think the easiest is to go to Planet Princeton, search for the article that uh, talks about the Monday, November 20th meeting at Palmer, at the Nassau Inn, and Crystal has there a link directly to the report. You can also go on the municipal website and click through, you know, eight pages and eventually get to it. So. What is the report called? Um, I think it's something like Princeton Parking Study. In fact, Princeton Parking Strategy. Okay, yes, hi. So, uh, I've also seen in Princeton that parking is used as a methodology of uh, governing, maintaining, say, setbacks at the street front or other types of, you know, zoning um, regs so that, you know, you, you maintain sort of a, a similar frontage and a streetscape and stuff like that where there's really <clears throat> nothing else that would prevent because the FAR or something else would allow you to build way more and so you can really expand and all of a sudden you're not following sort of the average <clears throat> setback along the front of the street and that creates sort of a visual chaos. The only thing that's holding it back is say the parking requirement because you can't fit more parking on the site. Um, and, and you can't park in the front yard. And you can't park in the front yard. So, so yeah, so this report actually doesn't address that issue. That's a little bit um, fine-grained, what this report is studying. Um, uh, that's, you know, Barry mentioned that to me when he walked in. It's, a, it's an important issue, um, but this report doesn't actually sort of go down lot by lot. Um, it's, on the residential neighborhood side, what this report uh, addresses in detail are the issues for people who don't have parking on their lot, for people who need to use on-street parking for their residents, who need to use on-street parking for a visitor to their home, who might only have one space and actually need a second space, and it addresses the issue of the overnight parking ban in the old borough boundaries, uh, and it has some interesting <coughs> solutions proposed for that. It does not really do a sort of lot size analysis of where parking is allowed 
and not allowed. I would just say that this is pri uh, primarily critical along places like the Witherspoon Withers Street corridor where the zoning is a mixture of, it's not just pure residential. There, I don't think that this becomes the, the big driver, but where you have a mix of residential and business, that, then it becomes a little bit more tricky. Okay, thanks. Um, <clears throat> I did my architecture apprenticeship in 1983 to 86 with an architect named Doug Kelbaugh. He's a really interesting architect who uh, was one of the early architects of uh, doing solar design in our community and really candidly uh, in the Northeast uh, in the 70s. He had a firm called Kelbaugh and Lee. Uh, Doug was a great person, uh, really was a role model for me as a young architect. And I was very lucky to work for Doug and Song Lee uh, in the mid 80s. And uh, Doug left Princeton. Doug had designed the solar Tromwell house on Pine Street, that some of you may know. Doug left Princeton in 1988, maybe seven, to go to University of Washington to be the chairman of the architecture program there. But I kept in touch with Doug for, we still are in touch, and it's, important for people who've been influenced by elders in their profession to keep in contact over the years. And five or so years after Doug left Princeton, he called me up and said, I want to take you to meet somebody. I want to take you to meet a young architect, planner, who's trying to do interesting town planning in New Jersey. And he took me to meet Joel Schwartz. And uh, we had a meeting, and Joel wanted Doug's advice on a plan that he was working on. And Joel asked a lot of questions about town planning that showed a sensitivity and awareness to issues in the early 1990s that candidly didn't pop up across America for another 10 or so years. Uh, so I'm very pleased that Joel and I have been friends ever since then. And uh, now Joel is a principal at Landmark Company, which is a design-oriented development firm located in Princeton and Keysby. Uh, Landmark has special interest in downtown redevelopment, that's sort of their specialty, and in revitalizing the centers of towns and small cities in New Jersey, including Rahway and Metuchen and Fairlawn, are three communities where they've done significant and important and formative work in the revitalization of those communities. Um, but in addition, Landmark owns and manages more than 3,000 rental apartments in central and northern New Jersey, so uh, this company is involved in design and planning and approval and construction and management, so they are really vertically organized and they experience the entire spectrum of what's involved in creating housing in New Jersey. Um, Joel received his undergraduate degree in American Studies from Brandeis and his master's in architecture from the University of Oregon, and I am very pleased to ask him to come up and talk to you about some of his experience uh, in the communities he's worked in. And then after Joel is done, we're going to come back and talk about some of the recommended strategies for our community uh, that came out of this study, but I also want you to look at them in light of what's happened in other communities in New Jersey to realize that the problems we face in Princeton are not unique. Joel, 